Yesterday, up in, uh, yeah, I watched it for a while. I just bawled my eyes out. I, was, uh, I, I got dehydrated watching, <laughs> watching. But for, for a lot of y'all that don't know what that was, it's you can go on YouTube, type in uh, Azusa. Az, okay, you can type it in and come up. It's pretty cool. But uh, something happened in the spirit yesterday. I really believe there was a, a shift. And uh, I think it, we saw a manifestation of it this morning in worship. It just there was a freedom. We're going to start seeing some things change in the, in the, in the kingdom, you know. So it's, it was good. Um, okay. We're in a series, um, training your soul. I mean, I'll getting to know this guy a little better. This is a teaching that will help you understand who you are. You are spirit, soul, and body. You have a body. That's what we all see you walking around in. And inside your body, there are, there, you have a soul and a spirit. Okay. Your spirits, the guy that got born again when you accepted Jesus, however old you were when you did that. And your soul is the guy that's been with you. It's what makes up your personality. It's all the programming, the good, bad, and ugly. It makes you, it's the th- way that you think or feel about things, the way you, that's, and that's your personality. That's, that's what makes you different than AJ. Okay. Um, but the, the soul can be a, almost like a child that's not been trained. You ever been been around kids that have no training? Never had correction? They do whatever they want? They're a lot of fun, aren't they? Whew. You ever been at a nice restaurant trying to have a romantic dinner with your wife or something and two two tables down or some untrained children? Now you almost want a refund. Hey, this those kids ruined our dinner because they don't have an inside voice. They're swinging from the chandeliers. I mean, they're just... You know, where do you eat, Brother Mike? <laughs> um, the rainforest out in Disneyland. But everybody acts that way. So we're going to, there's, there's seven ways you train your soul. We're on number two. Last week we talked about training them with the word. You'll never get your soul cooperating with you until you get in the word and find out what God says about how you're supposed to be, what his plans and purpose for your life is. I mean, God's got great plans for your life. Do you know your soul will rob you of entering into your destiny? I want to tell you something. The soul can be, the soul, your soul will kill you. Left unchecked, it'll kill you. Um, it'll kill relationships. Uh, God has sent people. How many of you have ever had people in your life that were a blessing or the relationship you knew was right and then for whatever reason something happened and then it went south and then you lost it? Yeah. Because the soul, it, I mean, it's stubborn. Doesn't repent real easy, does it? Yeah, I know. It doesn't. It doesn't. So, uh, so we're going to talk about today. The, the second thing you need to do in training your soul is this is called watch and pray. You got to watch your soul, because uh, especially in a time of pressure, anytime you're in a place of pressure or a time of pressure, um, you got to watch him, because he will, he'll bolt. You'll turn around and phew, he's gone. Um, Jesus said in Matthew twenty six forty one, it said, Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation, for the spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Okay? When Jesus was in Gethsemane, he was praying to his disciples, Hang with me. This is a serious time. I need you to really intercede. Hang with me. He came back a little bit later, and what were they doing? Sleeping. They just He warned them, didn't he? He said, Hey. <laughs> But it was a place of pressure. They got tired and went to sleep. Watch your soul in a place of pressure. The spirit's job is to watch over the untrained soul. Now, hear, hear that word, untrained? Some of y'all in this room have been working on your souls for a number of years. And in a lot of areas, you have a lot of victory. That's the key. You, you know, children are a blessing once you get them trained. Amen? Amen? Yeah. yeah. They are. I've raised seven, I know. Um, but if you just, the Bible says a child left to himself is his mother's shame. If you don't give him, if you don't put boundaries, we all need boundaries. Ba- boundaries will breed security in our life. I mean, we need to, we want to, we want to feel safe and secure. Yeah, boundaries help produce that. You know, when you, 
when you're a little kid and you're in the backyard, that fence is a boundary. But it also keeps you from that Rottweiler in the yard on the other side of the fence. I mean, I'll appreciate that one. Yeah. It also keeps you from running out in the street. If you, have. you ever notice a lot of houses don't have fences in the front. So when your children are little, there's, how come Johnny gets to play in the front yard and I have to play in the backyard? Well, Johnny's, you know, he's 10. You're three. Johnny don't run out in the street like you will. Johnny's been trained to walk, look both ways and see stuff like that. When they're little, they don't do that. They just, you ever notice little, little kids just walk around like this? And coffee tables are right at, when they're about that tall, it's right at that place where, you ever notice why God made your skull thick? Some are thicker than others. But it's, he did it for a reason, didn't he? Because we, we get hit in the head a lot. <laughs> Some of it manifests as you get older too, but um, he protects us because we're not paying attention. Especially when we started learning how to run. I can run. And we just ran like forced. And we ran into things and stuff. We didn't. Got to look. God put that. You ever notice God put the nose right over your mouth for a reason? And that's strategic. That's not just for cuteness or a place to hang glasses when you, when you, when you get older. No. It, you know, you're supposed to smell things. You know? I mean, you should sniff sometimes when in, when in, when in doubt. Sniff. And if it smells bad, don't put it in your mouth. I mean, little kids don't do that. No, they don't. They, they come up putting things in their mouth. Where'd you get that? Candy bar. Where'd you get that? Cat litter box. That's not a candy bar. I mean, kids just don't smell, do they? They just, babies automatically. You got to train them. Don't, you'll kill yourself. I'm telling you. Well, we got to watch over. It's, it's your spirit's job to watch over your soul. Now, what happens if you were born again like a, a week ago and you're 40 years old? Well, you got a 40-year-old soul and a one-week-old one spirit. Who do you think's the boss? Yeah, it's your soul. That's when you have big brothers in Christ, pastors, different people, fellow brothers and sisters that help watch over and say, hey, I probably wouldn't want to go down that road anymore. I mean, we're used to going down certain roads. Some of those roads we don't need to go down anymore. First um, Peter chapter 5, verse 7 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. As a roaring lion. That word uh, vigilant means to, be, to keep awake. That is to, to watch literally or figuratively. Be vigilant, to be awake, to be watchful. Go watch out when the devil's around. Now, obviously, we don't. We try to keep them out of here. We don't let people bring them in necessarily, but um, and that's our job is it, to have a, a, a safe spiritual environment to grow up in. Amen. You ought not get persecuted at church. Can't, I can't help what happens out in the world. But when you come into into the house of God, you ought to be loved. Nobody should say that's my seat. You can't sit there. Well, we we, we frown on that kind of stuff. It's like no, every, it's first come first serve. You know, just. Your people don't do that. Oh, yes, they do. There's ownership. That's mine. I've been in churches where their name of the on the pew, they have the, the family's name. They actually buy them in the South. Well, that is my pew. Well, is your name on it? Well, actually, it is. <laughs> That's kind of creepy. All right. But um, you got to watch this guy. As a roaring lion. I did a little study about that. Every time I read, find in the Bible God calling us eagles or soldiers or whatever, I look up that stuff. You know, the Bible says the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree and grow like the cedars in Lebanon. I looked up palm trees, and palm trees are kind of have a, some unique things about them. The more storms they go through, the stronger they get. How many of the more storms you and I go through, the stronger we get? The older they get, the sweeter their fruit is. You know, for a date palm that makes has fruit, they get older, they get sweeter. I mean, not not, old, not not everybody that gets older gets sweeter. You ever been around some cantankerous old folks? It's almost like it's a, they act like it's a rite of passage. I'm 70. I'm supposed to be like this. No, you're actually supposed to be sweeter. Um, well, it says a roaring lion. Now, a roaring lion are the old guys. You know, lions, as they get older, most most... 
I've watched a lot of Animal Planet, so I know what I'm talking about. Uh, the, how many of the, the the female lions do a lot of the hunting? Yeah. But the old lions, they'll roar. They have a strategy. They roar, and all the antelope and stuff go, oh, there's a lion over there. So what do they do? They turn the other way, and they run the opposite direction. Well, guess where the lionesses are? They're They're waiting on them. They literally have a strategy. So Satan's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So when he roars, you don't run from it. You actually keep on going. Because the older lions, don't, their teeth are kind of gone. They don't, they, you know, they don't have much teeth left. You know, Satan really can't take a plug out of you like people think. You know, people act like, oh, don't talk about the devil, man. He's so powerful. Only if you fear him. Fear does to the devil what faith does to God. You gotta, if you don't fear him, then you don't have to worry about it. And I'm not asking you to go find some occult, go in there and try to, you know, be Superman or something. You might get beat up in the process, but, um, we don't need to be fearful. And see, the word of God will remove fear because it tells you what God's, I mean, God wants to heal us. You know, Maureen's battling something right now in her body. Now she's believing God, the God's gonna, <laughs> Keep her around here. We're believing with her. Amen? Amen. Now, the thing is, you're believing God. How many of her soul at days can, her, there's days her soul can go, not feeling it. Not feeling that healing virtue. In fact, I feel everything but virtue. I feel, I feel, I feel pain. I feel, you know, I, don't, I feel, I feel fatigued. I feel like it's not working. But you have days where it don't feel like it works. Does that mean it's not working? That's when you have to stand on the word of God. Say, ah. See, that's why you got to get your soul. You got to train them to shut up. You ever had a friend that's tried to encourage you? Maybe you just broke up with your girlfriend or whatever, and you're kind of, I had this in high school. I had some buddies sometimes, you know, you're in love. Everything's great. Then all of a sudden she, you know, for whatever reason, she, uh, you're, we've all been there. <laughs> She's now seeing somebody else or whatever. And your friends try to encourage you. Oh, man. She was trouble anyway. Well, that's not how I feel. I still, still have feelings for her. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, they can try to encourage you, but the more they seem to encourage you, the worse it gets. Right. <laughs> well, your soul's like that. You don't listen to him because he's a liar. He wants, to, he wants the path of least resistance. He wants to do it the easy way. You know, standing, in, standing on the word of God and believing God to reconcile or to get healed or to believe God... How many of marriage is a commitment? We don't pray. We don't give these vows. Do you promise to stay with her as long as you feel it? How about you? You're going to stay with them as long as you feel it? Yeah, as long as I feel it. As long as it's there, I feel it. But if I don't feel it, let's then then get out. Who? What kind of ceremony is that? I mean, love's not a feeling. It's it's a, it's a verb. It's an action. You know, I wear this ring all the time, not just when I feel it. Some days I don't feel it so much. But I don't go, hey, Brent, I'm taking this off today. Not feeling it. <laughs> she doesn't like that. No, I'm committed. It's a commitment. You know? Because that momentary thing when you feel like it's a, you know, that when you're, we all have tiffs. We get in those little spats, but we get over it. We move on. Amen? Um, there's more good days than bad. Way more. Hallelujah. God's so good. Um Hallelujah. Uh, like, a, like a roaring lion seeking whom he may. Didn't say whom he shall. May devour. You going to let him devour you? I'm teaching you right now one way how to get him where he can't devour you. If you get, see, we got, all of us got issues. All of us, all of us, our souls got fear of different things. Thing is, go after that thing you're afraid of and find out what God says. Amen. You know, maybe you're afraid of commitments. I married my first wife twice. Don't tell me I didn't try. Twice. But you know, I didn't chunk marriage out just because she left both times. The one I got right now is a keeper. I have been miserably married and I have been happily married. Now I want you all to experience the latter. Amen? Amen. He that finds a wife finds a good thing obtains favor with the lord brenda gives me favor with god she makes me look good 
That's what it that's basically means. A good woman makes a man look good. Man, you look sharp. Man, my wife did this thing. I just, she lays it on, I just put it on. Oh, man, you look like you're gaining weight. Man, she's a good cook. I'm surprised Sean is as lean as he is. Man, Beth, she's a good cook. She, if she opened a restaurant, I'd be eating there every day. Hallelujah. Well, you know, he that finds a wife finds a good thing, obtains favor with the Lord. Um, two are better than one. You get more work done. I mean, there's a lot of reasons. Yeah, but what if it goes south? I won't tell you something. I can almost guarantee if you, if you, if you serve God and do it, by, live by the Bible, I don't fear divorce. None of my kids, I don't worry about none of my kids getting divorced. They don't even walk around going, hey, dad, what do you think? I don't, we don't ever talk about that because I believe you can get rid of that. You can get that. You can be divorce free. We do all, we teach everybody to do the things to keep you, keep you from being, getting divorced. Amen? Yeah. We ain't had a divorce in this church in 25 years. That speaks, people. Well, then we should go here. This is the church we should go to, honey. Because <laughs> in, in this world, Jesus said, you're going to have tribu- tribulations, trials. Everybody has trials. But we got people that know how, they've been there, done that, been through those trials. People that got to the other side, that's who I want to guide me. I don't want to climb Mount Kilimanjaro with somebody, you know, that's got to read in the book how to climb Mount. I don't want that guy with the yellow book. I want the guy that's been there many times that knows how to get to the top. I don't want to spend half, you know, three days going to a place only that goes to a cliff. It's like, well, that's not really good. <laughs> yeah, I guess we should have turned back there. I didn't see that in the book. I want the guy that's been there, done that. See, there's people all in this room, been there, done that. Had experience. Your experience you go through prepares you to help other people. That's what the Bible teaches. The Bible says we comfort people with the same comfort God gives us when we go through that trial. And we have all common trials. Everybody in this room got the same kind of, you know, this alien abduction. Nah, not really. <laughs> if you met an alien, it was an angel. Amen. No, they didn't, they didn't do any weird things to you, so get over it. But anyways, we have all common, we have all things common. You know, everybody in this room gets tempted with the same things. And if you find somebody that's overcome, hang out with him. All right. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Give um, all your worries and cares to God, for he careth for you. And, and King James says, Casting all your cares on him, because he cares for you. Casting all your cares. That literally casting means, it's like writing down a piece of paper. I am worried about this. I am concerned about this i have financial fears and writing it all down then wadding up and then throwing it over on god and god going got it now we do that in prayer we'll say god i got this situation i want you to get involved in it god goes i'm on it and then we'll get up from prayer and we'll start walking back to our seat and what happens we just kind of yeah, Michael Jackson didn't come up with a moonwalk. I think some Christian guy just, we pick it up and we just put it in our pocket. That was too much. I don't want to, I don't think you have time to handle stuff. That's probably a biggie. He created the world, people. He can handle your problems. Amen. But see, the soul loves to, the Bible says, oh, magnify the Lord. Let us exalt his name together. Psalms 34, 7. Magnify the Lord. How many of the soul likes to magnify the problem? You go to the mailbox, you open up here, you get, you get a, your electric bill. Oh, my gosh, it's it's $100 more than it was last month. $100 is not going to break heaven or you. Okay? But the soul will magnify that by the end of the day. It's a, it's $10,000. No, it's still 100 bucks, but it feels like 10000 Because it just, it just magnifies it. It does it with everything. Got a little headache by the end of the day. It's a it's a migraine, man. I think my head's about to split. That's because all you thought all day was your pain in your head. How about you want to say, Jesus, touch my head. Get rid of this headache in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I've tried that. It didn't work. Well, then go take some Tylenol. God don't care if you take Tylenol. If it gets rid of your headache, he wants you to not be a grouch. You ever been religious people? I don't take medicine. Oh, well, you're in pain and you're miserable. If it heals you, it's God. Amen? Because God wants you happy. 
We want you happy. Because none of us, and I mean none of us, are, are that much fun when we're not at, when we're hurting. Amen? Yeah, we break dates, all kinds of things when we're not feeling good. Honey, you want to go to that concert tonight? <sighs> yeah, I got a migraine. Let's go. <laughs> no, honey, I think we'll just sit this one out. No, we bought tickets. We're going. I mean, I was, you shouldn't go. You go. It's, it's a bad time. She's not having fun. You go, you're fighting on the way home. Something... Something told me. (laughs) You know, there's a story about different names of God. You know, he's God, Jehovah God. He's uh, he's, uh, El Shaddai, more than enough. There's all these different names of God. Well, there's one name that not a lot of people know about. It's something. You know, God's called something. Most, Most of us don't relate to that, but you know what I'm talking about. There's times in your life where... You went to that concert with her with a migraine, but something told me. <laughs> I should have stayed home. We didn't listen to that something. Well, that's one of the names of God, so just, I know, I'm deep. I never heard that. I've heard all those other names. I never heard something. Yeah. I'll take you places. All right. So it says to um, be vigilant because your adversary, we only have one adversary. Um, in the New Living Translation, it says, give all your worries and cares to God because he cares about you. Stay alert. Watch out for your, the, your great enemy, the devil, who prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Uh, worry, worrying builds pressure. Worrying, that's what it does. It b- builds pressure and it, it, it'll burn holes in your stomach. Yeah. A lot of benefits in worrying. Not good, but there are benefits. Um, cares means distractions. That word care in the Greek means distraction. Casting all your cares on him. In the Greek, that word means distraction. How many we get distracted? We set off trying to do something. We're starting to believe God for something. And lots of distractions try to get us off that. This is why you watch your soul in, in times when you're going through a, a place of pressure. Some of y'all are in a place of pressure right now. Some of y'all aren't. Some of y'all just came out of a place of pressure. You know, enjoy the season. It won't last. There's other ones coming. But that life's full of pressures. Life's full of trials. It just, that's what happens. You know, sometimes you're going through a, re, a, a moment of time of reprieve. I like those times. Um, so, you watch, you watch the end of, this is, Jesus said, watch and pray. We're going to talk about praying in a minute, but. I want to. I want to. I don't want to walk away from this word. Watch. You watch out when you're going through it. When your wife's pregnant, how I many? There comes a season where you got to start watching. I mean, on the lat, when, where she gets later on in that pregnancy, things that were pretty easy to do get kind of more difficult to do. I mean, that's when you men should step it up and start helping out, not adding to it. She hasn't seen her feet in, you know, a couple of months. You know, it's difficult to do things. And we're just, hey, honey, can you, can you iron this? Can you, can you do this? Don't keep adding to it. How about helping her out? Because she's, she's literally going through a, a season right now, you know. Um, and that you could just, well, if people would just tell me that when they're in a place of pressure, we don't we don't always like to walk around and advertise that. Hey, I'm going through a place of pressure right now. Wear a T-shirt. I'm in a place of pressure. You know, we need to be a little more sensitive. Sometimes we could just, sometimes just do the math. You know, I'm, Maureen's going going through a, a she's battling cancer right now, so we should understand that. Well, I didn't know that. You know, sometimes just pay attention. I know she's been losing weight. We're gonna diet you on. That's the chemotherapy diet. No. Oh, that one's a tough one. Yeah, I don't recommend it. Yeah. You know, sometimes we just be, be a little sensitive, but just if we knew, the Bible says, know those who labor among you. If we knew each other and didn't just attend church, if we actually knew each other, we would know what's going on in each other's lives. We're supposed to. And we'd be more sensitive and we'd try to help out. You know, something might, you know, something, there he is again. Thanks. <laughs> Jehovah something. You know, something would tell you, you know, I think I, may, I might want to make Maureen a dinner. You know, some guys in the church went over and mowed her yard the other day. That's, you know, that's a good thing. That's what you're supposed to be doing. 
Pure religion, undefiled before God. You visit the widow in their afflictions. When women are, when they're widows or they're not married or they're single moms and they have afflictions, you should be helping them out. I wonder what my ministry is. You ride by her yard and she's like, she's going to, she's trying to get to the mailbox with a machete. You know, it might be that you should go mow her yard. Well, if, she didn't, if she'd call, I would be on it. You know, a lot of us have trouble doing that. We shouldn't, but we do. Because uh, we say stuff like, anything you need, let me know. We say that, but we don't necessarily follow through with that. How about we get more sensitive? What would Jesus do? I love that little WWJD. I think that needs to come back around. I don't think it got, I don't think Jesus got the full benefit of that little, little bracelet that was out for several years. It kind of came and went and people didn't get it. What would Jesus do? He wouldn't let the, he wouldn't let the grass get this high. He'd be notif- he'd be mindful of that. And he, you wouldn't have to wait for her to call you. You would know, I cut it this month. And if it needs it next month, I'll go back and do it again. Because she can't do it right now. Oh, yeah. Okay. Watch and pray. One more scripture and we're going to talk about praying. Um, Isaiah chapter 10, verse 12 uh, says, Therefore, I, it shall come to pass when the Lord hath performed the whole work upon Mount Zion, that's the church, and on Jerusalem, and I will punish the stout heart of the king of Assyria for the glory of his high looks, for he has said... Now, this king of Assyria was literally a real king, but this is a type and shadow also of Lucifer. I mean, you know, he's, uh, he thinks he's the, he's, the, he's the king. Well, the Bible calls him the god of this world, small g, but it calls him a god of this world. It says, for I am prudent, I have removed, well, I'll skip some. For he has said, by my strength in my hand, I have done it, and by my wisdom, for I am prudent. I have removed the bounds of the people. Has Satan taken away the boundaries of people today? Oh, my goodness, he's, he's doing a good job. He's got people so confused about boundaries, there are people now who don't even know if they're male or female. I mean, male and female is a boundary. North Carolina, the, the mayor of Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, just lost a big contract with uh, PayPal because they were going to put a, their, co- their company there and have 400 jobs for the people of that area. But guess what? They, they got the mayor signed an ordinance for uh, this uh, gender confusion people. He, they, he said, we're not going to pass that. It's going to be men's bathroom and women's bathroom. We're going to leave it that way. He said, it's common sense. Well, people at PayPal got offended by that because, see, Satan's trying to remove boundaries, people. He's trying to get, they say there's six genders. I don't know what AJ, no wonder they took AJ three times to figure out what his kid was. <laughs> I thought they were just trying to find the right, the right, the right position, you know. This little guy, is, he's been all balled up, but it turns out, you know, and I... These, these sonogram people go out of business. Well, what's the point of calling them male and female? Because who really knows? Oh my goodness! Isn't that crazy? I mean, I'm, 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 I turned 61 last last Sunday was my birthday, which is still a month long celebration. So you you that, you that didn't you that didn't get your cards and letters in, hey, I'm still waiting. Praise God. Okay, but um, I'm 61. To think that you know when you watch Andy of Mayberry or Opie, we're the same age. And I, I, I watch that, the Andy Griffith show sometimes, and I look at some of the clothes Opie, I wore some of those same, he's got my shirt on. We wear, you know, it's kind of, so I, I'm kind of from that generation. I never thought in my lifetime that these would be actual things that people are actually talking about. You know, 20 years ago you said one day people in America will be confused whether they're male or female. He went, right. One day they'll be marrying the same sex. <laughs> right. Bing. What happened just in the last few years? I mean, I'm, I'm not Rip Van Winkle. I haven't been sleeping that long, but something's happening. Satan's removing the boundaries, and here's what's happening. Nobody's doing nothing. That's why he's doing it. See, what happened yesterday in Los Angeles, and it started yesterday morning till 10 o'clock last night, People were praying from all denominations. I saw a Catholic priest praying to a Protestant 
to, to over Lou Ingalls. And he said, I wanted to wash your feet, but the weather doesn't really permit that. He said, I just want to kiss your feet. So he, he's down there on the ground, and he's, and he's kissing this guy's shoes. And you know, some of y'all might think that's weird, but that's, that's about as humble as a man can do to humble be- himself before another man. He's saying, we're so sorry that the Catholic Church has, has kind of went boo, taboo to, to Protestants. And we're humbling ourselves, saying, we just want to, we're all brothers in Christ. There were some miraculous things that happened yesterday. And all the big dogs were there. I mean, from every major denomination in America, the Baptists, the Methodists, the Charismatics, the Pentecostals, all of them, everybody, every camp was represented. On God TV, 30 nations around the world saw it. Millions and millions of people. It happened right this, right, just right down the road. Now, the good news is, why are people doing this? Because people are realizing that things are out of control. If we can't get along with each other, how are we going to convert the world? So God's calling. The Bible says judgment begins first at the house of God. For if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the sinner and ungodly appear? So God's doing a number on the church right now. He's saying, hey, focus. You know, it's no point in even praying about stuff if you're not, if you, if you're not going to live it. And Lou, was, he was pretty radical yesterday. He says, hey, if you got ought against somebody, pick up your phone and call them right now. Right now, not not to, uh, when you feel led. Right now, and say, "Hey, I'm sorry." So a lot of people were making peace yesterday. It was awesome. Um, so he goes on and says, "I am prudent. I have removed the bounds of the people, and I have robbed their treasures." I mean, a divorce is 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 another weapon of the enemy to to take dad out of the house because it robs a treasure. Isn't it a treasure to have a dad growing up? Isn't it a treasure to have a mom? Really? I mean, these are treasures. You know, God's been, divorce has gone nuts, people. And, you know, right now people are are fearful to get married because they, they only got a 50-50 shot. That's not a really, that's not really good odds. But see, with God, you can have a hundred. See, I am a hundred percent convinced Brent and I are going to grow old together. I'm convinced. I don't, I don't worry about that. I don't, I don't think like, I wonder if this really bothers her. Uh, you know, I don't worry about stuff like that. I don't worry about us giving up on each other. In fact, it just gets better with time. We like a fine wine. It gets better with time. You know, it's neat to have somebody in your life, which, you know, because you have somebody that um, kind of, you have that history together, but you have somebody that you shared your life with. You know, that you can look back and go, remember when? We were talking yesterday about, uh, we were at this concert yesterday at the Ramona Music Festival, and this song, Susie Q, came on by Credence Clearwater Revival, CCR. And as soon as it came on, I looked over at Brent, I said, remember when we did that video about Megan? Oh, I was holding her singing. I was singing to her. We had Susie Q playing in the background, but I was dancing around with my little daughter, Oh, Megaloo, baby, I love you, Megaloo. And when I said that, she said, yes, I, I felt like yesterday. Well, Megan's like 22 or 3. She was like 3. That was 20 years ago. But it seemed like yesterday. Because you had somebody that went through, went through that with you together. You have that remembrance. You have somebody that, that, you know, that journaled your life with you, that kind of looked back and looked back and it matters. Somebody's there. I remember this. I had a landlord one time. This guy that was uh, he was from Canada, and I have to be careful because he's on YouTube now, so I don't get myself in trouble. So far, I got a lot of likes. Uh, <laughs> but he just he he uh, was a he was a bachelor, and um, he was like fifty or sixty, and he had the jet boat in his garage, and he had the jet skis, and he had had hockey equipment. He, this guy was had all this stuff that. All the toys that guys, big boys want, but he didn't have a wife. He was a playboy. He had all the, all the women. But you know, one day he's going to grow old, and all them women ain't going to be around. You know, I'm glad when I had a open heart surgery a year ago, my wife was right there by my side. I have a picture because Luke took a picture for me. You're not supposed to take pictures, and I found out later they don't like you taking pictures, and and in your intensive care, but I asked him to because I, I don't remember it. 
Good drugs. Good drugs. <laughs> I don't remember that. I was just talking to the guy. Next thing you know, I'm in, I'm in ICU. I don't remember when, even when I went out. They were just talking to you and something, they got a little drip going. But she was there in this picture that Luke, it's in my phone. This picture Luke has, he's took for me. You know, I got all these tubes in me and all the stuff and it's pretty, it's pretty scary looking. But there in this picture, there's Bren. Right there. Right there. See, I, you know, that's, that's what you get in covenant. You get that guarantee that somebody's praying. Well, you got all those machines, all the you know, thank God for machines and technology. Because, you know, there was a time I actually was dead for a while. They actually stopped my heart, pulled it out of my chest, worked on it, put it back in. And I had a machine pumping my blood and a machine breathing for me. Your pastor is amazing. I have a T-shirt that says it would have killed most men. <laughs> Tiffany and them hooked me up with that. It would have killed most men. And it would have killed most men, but here I am. Uh, but there she was. Hallelujah. Man, I just, I love you guys. And I, I believe God wants to, man, make things so much better for all of us. Don't you believe it? Isn't it God's will to, to make you happier than you are? How many of y'all are happy? I mean, you know, God wants to make you happier. I say this to people all the time. People say, how's it going? And I say, I, I literally, I say, if it gets any better, I can't stand it. That's how I feel. If it gets any better, I can't stand it. Things just keep getting better and better. And I, I can hardly stand it. Oh, that's a good one. Well, aren't you special? Aren't you just lucky? No, I've been working on my soul. And this guy now works with me, not against me. Um, I've robbed their treasures. I have put down the inhabitants of the land like, like a valiant man, like a warrior. And I have found as a nest the riches of the people and have gathered eggs that are left um, that are left, I have gathered all the earth. Now, Satan's just going to go around stealing from families and stealing from people, just like taking eggs from a, a chicken. And it says, And there was none that moved their wing, opened their mouth, or peeped. Now, now in the natural, you go stealing from a mama hen, you're about to get, about to get clawed. You have to go get those eggs when she's not around. You don't go and get the eggs when all, all right, you chickens, get off the eggs. I've come to steal from you. You're about to get clawed. You wait till the chickens are out in there in the yard, scratching and pecking, and then you go into there and you get the eggs. Oh, that's how that works. Well, that explains all these scratches. Yeah, there's a force. There's a better way. Um, He said, Satan steals and no one, no one even did anything about it. Why? Because nobody was watching. See, I really believe that it's the, the, the man's job primarily in the home to watch. It's Sean's job to be watching his kids and make sure that their, their attitudes aren't changing. Matt, it's your job to watch over your family and stuff. Because in, in divine order, God, Satan, you should be standing between you and the devil concerning your wife and kids. He, guys, he has to get through you to get to them. If, they, if he's getting to them and you ain't doing nothing about it, Shame on you. You're not doing your job. It's our job as men and husbands to stand watching. We're protectors. Amen? That's the way it works. God holds that. He gave us that position. Lee, you're the protector of your home. Satan can't get to Desiree unless he comes through you. So you got to get your fight on. You got to be tough. You know, I watch men in America a lot of times. We think that we go to work and that's our big thing we do for our family. You know, if you weren't married, you would still go to work. You would still have a place to live. Maybe not as big, but you'd still have a place. To live. And you'd still be buying food and you'd still have electricity. And you'd still be, you know, all that stuff that you're providing for them. You provide for yourself. No, I wouldn't use electricity. I'd take cold showers. Oh, you, you would not. I'd live in a tent. No, you wouldn't. You would live in a house like the rest of us. Now, the thing is, so that's something you do for yourself. But as, as, as a, a father, our job doesn't stop when we get home. Hey, <laughs> not before church. Uh, <laughs> need a lighter moment, this attention breaker. All right. Our job, what happens in America? Guys come home, and we plop on the couch or whatever, pick up the remote, and there we go. And we think our job's done. 
So what's mom doing? She's still taking care of the kids and still doing stuff. You know, mamas, they don't work nine to five. Till them babies are asleep, till they're asleep, not in bed. Bed's, bed's still, you're still working. Cause until they're, <clears throat> till they're out, you're, you gotta be watching. Cause some, some kids will get out of bed. They're sneaky. They'll, mom, dad's watch TV. That's mom. They'll, they'll hurt themselves. You got to, ladies, you know, you have that discernment. Something's up. Why? I don't hear anything. That's, yeah, that's it. I don't hear anything. That's it. It's too quiet. Something's, something's amiss. And you go in there and they got bobby pins in the, in the little, where does, there's something in this wall. Cause it keeps, there it is again. <laughs> yeah, it's called electricity. I don't see it. Well, it's there. I mean, there are things that they're doing, you know. You got to pay attention, right? But we've been off for hours. We come in, mom's doing all this stuff, and we we just walk in and go, I'm really hungry, what's for dinner? Not even paying attention that she's up to here. She's in quicksand going, sorry, a little busy right now, honey. We as husbands need to pay attention when we walk in the door. We're supposed to assess what's going on. Some of us walk in, hey, baby, what? I'm going golfing. <laughs> and guys just leave when that's when you should really say, whoa, what's going on? Something's up. We don't run from it. Amen. What happens when people, um, why well, just got louder? Um, kids come up to their parents and say, dad, I'm going to, I'm going to go for a, can I go to my friend's house? Ask your mother. You know what they do? Ask, See guys, we gave that. Why, why do some, in some homes, you ask who's the boss in America. 90% of the time it's mom. Mom rules the roost. Why? We gave it up. We gave them that authority. It was ours. God gave it to the man first. You know, I've seen guys wear a t-shirt. I'm the boss. My wife says so. That's, you shouldn't wear stuff like that. That's just mocking God. Amen? Because God has made the man the head of the household. Okay. Now, if he's, if he's clueless, ladies, you should help inform him. You're a help me. That's what you do. You help inform him what's going on. He can't discern everything. But, you know, if, if the kids, have, you know, we should notice when our kids' personalities, and when things are shifting, when their self-esteem starts dropping and we can, they, when their countenance changes. Because kids go or daily in public schools being hit with stuff that's affecting the way they view themselves. And as parents, our job is to make sure that we keep them Edified, built up, encouraged. The two most powerful voices in the earth today are mom and dad. Because what you speak over your children carries way more weight than what the friends do. Especially in the formative years. Now when they hit those teen years, I'm sorry, I don't know what happens at that point. Something goes haywire and it starts all over again. But if you have laid a good foundation and you have a good relationship with your sons and daughters, when they hit those teen years... That's when they need your guidance the most. From 13 to 20, those seven years are the most destructive years in all of our lives. We did things from 13 to 20 that some of us just now are getting back on the right road. I mean, that's sad. And what do most parents, they just, during that season, my kids, we don't get to use the trump card. They're teenagers. That's when they need us the most. That's when they're not, they're not really children anymore, so they can't relate to their little, their little brothers and sisters, but they're not adults either. They're in that real awkward stage. Their body makes them think they're adults, but their minds still aren't developed there. And we got all these kids doing, going out and doing things and going places and doing things that they're just not ready for. And it gets them in a lot of trouble. And then they got parents wanting to bail. I don't know, my kids out there. I'm just wanting to write them off. You know, that's when they need you the most. You know, and the problem with that is because some parents, they're not, they're, their soul's not more developed than a teenager's soul, anyways. This is why this teaching is important. We need to grow up. And you will never grow up until your soul grows up. You ever seen a 50 year old man throw a fit like a five year old? It's embarrassing, isn't it? Why can't I have that Corvette? I want that Corvette. Well, honey, we have five children, and the two-seater car is not really practical for our whole family getting around in. I don't understand why. Y'all could take the bus. You know, you know I mean, your kids, when they want something, they're not rational. 
I've seen adult men just be stupid because it's what they want and not what's needed. I mean, oh, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. You know that word love there? It's a special word. It's a love that gives what's needed, not what's wanted. I mean, we needed a savior. I mean, we didn't want one. We want lottery numbers. We want money. We want, you know, whatever. But that's not what God, God says. He gave us what we needed. We needed someone to redeem us and save us. Hallelujah. Okay. So we got to watch this. I mean, your soul's got a job now to watch over. Actually, it's your spirit's job to watch over your soul. Until this guy gets trained. Now, when your soul gets trained and starts cooperating with you, man, life gets easy. When you don't always question everything. I don't know why, why, when, where. You know, children growing up. Some of y'all talk to your children way too much. You're, you're negotiating. You need to stop that. You're the boss. You need to tell them, you know, you need to come in, John. It's time to come in. Why? Because I said so. Why? Because it's getting dark. Why? Because the sun's going down. Why? See, you're just, you're just, you know, until they, children need to obey, obey your parents. Say, Johnny, come in. Yes, ma'am. And comes inside. That's a, that's a trained child. Now, how'd you get Johnny to do that? Well, because when Johnny first responded was, why? They got to learn to obey you on command, not just negotiate. You know, you take a dog. You take a stick and you go outside and you throw the stick and you go, fetch. The dog, well, if you wanted it, why'd you throw it away? All right. And he runs out there and he gets the stick and he comes back and you give him, pat him on the head and you give him a biscuit. Yeah, that was pretty good. I got a biscuit out of the deal. All right, I'm on board. And you throw the stick again and he's out there and you're, what are you doing? You're teaching him a trick. Actually, you're trying to teach him to be obedient. Now, if you've been doing this for weeks and man, every time you get out there with Fido's, I know this one, you know, you grab that stick and you pull back and you throw that stick and you point your dog and go, stay. Now that dog for three, two or three weeks, it's been every time you throw the stick, I'm after it. Now you've injected something new into his theology. <laughs> stay. Yes. And he goes, <laughs> everything in him wants to run. Now, if he runs after the, after the stick and brings it back, you have a, you have, he's learned a trick. But if he stays, you've taught him obedience. Now, see, we're trying to teach our children to be obedient. Because there's coming a day in their life they're going to be running out in the street. And you see a car come around that corner and you go, stop! Why? <laughs> Are you going to say you're sorry on that one? So you don't want to teach kids tricks. You want to teach them obedience. Now, when children learn to be obedient to, to your authority, then you can start explaining why. But quit doing this. Uh, we're, we're trying to make them grow up before they're smart enough to know what we're even talking about, people. Train them. The Bible says train up a child in the way that he should go. You know what the word train means? It means like training a dog. It means that word train means narrow their choices. Not what do we do? We give them more choices. Narrow them. We're having cereal for breakfast. I don't want cereal. Okay, then get up. From the table, because that's what we're having. Because you're teaching them to be thankful for whatever's in front of them. Well, I don't like cereal. Well, then that's fine. You don't have to eat. Go on. You're gonna get, you'll probably really enjoy lunch today, because you're missing breakfast. I could not send my kid to school without a meal. Oh, yeah, they're going to die. American children are not starving to death. Hello. But we're teaching them to be thankful. The Bible says, in everything, give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus and concerning you. Having food and raiment, therewith be content. How are you going to teach your children to be thankful if, if, you keep, if they never have to settle? If you always give them what they want, what's going to happen? They're going to get older, and they're going to read the Bible, and they're going to find out that God says don't, and they're going to go, yeah, whatever. My mom, mom and dad said don't. It doesn't mean don't. It means kind of, sort of, maybe. It means negotiate. And they're going to find out God don't negotiate. So we're teaching children to obey the authorities that God's put in their life because one day we turn them over to a higher authority. All of my sons and daughters, you know, they're, they're, they're my kids, but they're turned over to God. They answer to God. They don't answer to me. Hello. All right. Watch and pray. 
You know what prayer does? Prayer weakens the soul and strengthens the spirit. Why don't we all just admit our souls are pretty strong? And some of your souls are like Hercules. You know, and your, your spirit's like this little, you know, this little scrawny little starving to death guy. Hey, how's it going? You know, I remember one time watching one of those care commercials on TV years ago, and that shows these people starving to death, you know, and my kids were like, how come they don't wipe the flies off their face, Dad? That's gross. I'm going, because that takes effort. That takes energy, son. These people are starving. They don't have any energy. They didn't get that. It's just gross. The flies are just all over their face. They're not doing anything about it. Well, you know, there's lots of flies. But to do that takes a certain amount of effort, energy. And they don't have any food. They don't have any energy. And that's when it kind of clicked for them. Oh, wow, they're really, yeah, they're weak, son. They're, they're starving. They didn't get that. They just saw something that looked gross. I mean, you know, a lot of us just click commercials like that. We just click it, go on so we don't have to look at it. So we don't have to have a response to that. That's another thing that makes us numb. Is pretending things aren't really as bad as they really are. Okay. We're supposed to pray. Luke chapter 18, verse 1 says, He spake a parable unto this end, saying, Men ought always to pray and not faint, not quit. That's the King James. The Message Bible says, Jesus told them a story showing them it was necessary for them to pray consistently and never quit. Quitters, the people that quit are people that don't pray. Luke, the new, the new Living Translation says, Jesus one day told his disciples a story and showed them that they should always pray and never give up. We give up. We quit. Why? Because we started praying and then we said, oh, it's just not working. And we quit praying. When do you quit praying? When you see the, whatever you're praying for, when you see the end result. If you're praying for a loved one to get saved, when do you quit praying for them? When they answer the altar call and they come home, hey, I gave my heart to Jesus today. (laughs) I only prayed 10 years. You know, I know I know a woman in Laurel, Mississippi, and she prayed for her husband for 50 years. They were married 50 years. And, you know, two years before he died, he got saved. Sister Kilpatrick, she prayed for her husband 50 years. And he gave his heart to Jesus. And the last two years before he died, he died of cancer. Before cancer took him, you know what? It was the best two years. He said it was worth all the 50 years that he wasn't a Christian for the last two that he was. Man, people like that bless me. Well, I prayed for a week. Didn't see nothing, so I figured it wasn't God's will. Now, it's so good that God wrote it down, so we can't use that as an excuse. His will is not a mystery. Beloved, I wish that, that it's the Father's good. I'm just going to get this right. I know that it's God's will that none perish, but all come to repentance. I don't know if, my God, if, I don't know if God wants my kids saved. Well, it's, Scripture says he doesn't want none to perish. So, yes, it is. It is God's will that your son gets saved, your daughter gets saved, your wife gets saved, your husband gets saved. It's his will. Well, I prayed. It seemed like the more I prayed, the worse it got. Well, that's probably a good sign. You know, when you throw a lifeline out to somebody in the ocean and they're bobbing around and you keep praying, praying's pulling them in. Where's the roughest water? Right before the shore. That's where it starts to break. That's where it gets, that's when you don't quit praying. That's when a lot of times people give up. It just got where I just couldn't hardly take, take it anymore. That's when you, that's when you knuckle down. That's when, that's when you, Separates the men from the boys because the Bible says in patience, possess your soul. Patience, that word patience is hupamene. It means endurance. That's when you hang in there and you buckle down, you tie a rope around you, whatever you got to do, say, I am not moving. It is getting close and I'm not giving up. That's what brings us in. My dad prayed for me for years. And I want to tell you something, I I was out there. But one day... I came home from camping out. And I, first person I went to see was my dad. And I, I walked up to him and said, Dad, thanks for praying for me. I gave my heart to Jesus last night in the woods. He didn't see that coming. 
Most, most people don't go out camping to come home saved. But God spoke to me out in the woods and I gave my heart to the Lord. But he had been praying. I remember one night I came in from after hanging out with my friends and getting everybody home safe. And I don't know how I got home many, many nights, but I got walking in the door and I'm being so quiet, you know, it's four in the morning and I'm going, I'm crawling up the stairs because I was free. My dad come in, I remember him flicking on the light and there I was halfway up the stairs, you know, looking like that. Hey dad, sorry. Now he should have grabbed me by my ponytail and drug me down the stairs and beat me like a yard dog. And I would have felt okay about that because I needed it, but he didn't. He did something worse. He cut off the light. He went to the living room and he got on his knees and he prayed. And the Holy Spirit magnified his prayer. It was like a speaker right next to my, in my bed. I'm laying in bed and I hear my dad going, Oh God. And he's not being loud because he doesn't want to wake anybody up, but he's just praying. But you know, God knows how to magnify things for special people's ears. The ones that needed to hear it. And I just heard my dad weeping in the living room and saying, Oh God, don't let him die. Don't let him die. I don't want to see him. I don't want to lose him to hell. Oh God. And he cried out. It was life and death. He knew that there was a treasure there and he didn't want the enemy to steal it from him. So he, he fought like a man and prayed. He didn't get impatient and kick me out and say, you drug addict, get out of my home. He fought like a man, like a man of God. And I want to tell you something. It wasn't but a few months after that prayer. Now, he prayed that for years, but that particular one seemed to magnify <laughs> It's like a neon light laying in bed. Loser. <laughs> Get it together. You're breaking your parents' heart. And so when I came home one night from the woods and said, hey, Dad, I gave my heart to Jesus last night. It wasn't like he was surprised because that's what he'd been praying. See, you pray till you hear that result. Men ought always to pray and not quit, cave in. He didn't quit. Thank God he didn't. You that are, have, my life has touched your, many people in this room. You got George Hall to thank for that because he was the one who prayed and interceded. So when you see him in heaven, give him a high five. Go, hey, appreciate you praying for your son. Your son impacted my life, but he impacted my life. All right. Hosea chapter 10, verse 12 says, uh, sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes. When do you pray? Till he comes, till you get the answer to that prayer and rain righteous upon you. Righteous means a right standing till that situation gets right. That's you pray till that happens. Fallow ground is ground that's been plowed up and nothing really was planted. So it kind of got hard and you have to go plow it up again. Um, Isaiah 43, one says, but now thus saith the Lord who created thee, created you and uh, o Jacob, and formed you, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by my name. You're mine. Hey, you're God's. When you pass through the waters, what? Through the waters, not to the waters. I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you when you walk through the fires, or th- through the river, uh, yeah, through the fires, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you. For I am. The Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. When you go through something. See, some of us get to it and we don't pray. We look at the circumstance and the situation and our soul magnifies the river. It's a creek, but we stare at it long enough. It turns into the Mississippi and we go, I can't do this. Instead of trusting the Lord to get you on the other side. You know, some of y'all right now are going through some situation in your life where you're trying to get to the other side of that thing. I want to hear, I'm here to tell you, don't let your soul rob you because if you don't cross that river, you're going to, have to come, you're going to go around the mountain again and come only, only back to that place. We have to go through these things because there's something on the other side that's worth making this journey. Hallelujah. I wrote here, um, unbelievers, Unbelief doesn't pray. I don't know why, why I should pray about that. I don't know. If God, I don't think God will do that for me. What makes you think that? See, when people say, I don't think God would do that for me, tells me they don't read their Bibles. Because there's over 500 promises in the Word of God. It covers every need 
you don't even think about having. It tells you how to have friends. tells you how to have a good marriage. tells you how to raise your children. tells you how to be healthy. tells you tells you how to talk. tells you how to think. I mean, it tells you everything. Hallelujah. It tells you everything. So, if you, well, I didn't, I didn't know that was in the Bible. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper. Do you know God wants you to prosper? Yeah. Above all things, he wants you to prosper. And be in health. He wants you healthy. Well, that's really... You know, people say stuff like, well, you know, Maureen's got this cancer. God's trying to teach her something. What in the world would God teach you with cancer? What does that teach you? Who does that? What parent says, hey, your kid's got the flu. Yeah, God's teaching them something. What would you, what, your son's burning up with fever. He hurts all over. He's crying. He's throwing up. What part of that is teaching him anything? There are people, religious people talk like that sometimes because they don't read their Bibles. They think that everything happens to you is God's will. Not everything that happens to you is God's will. A lot of things that happen to you is your choice. You chose. And when it don't work out the way you want to, you blame God. God, what was you thinking? You know, one reason I know my children, are, their marriage is going to work because it's God's choice. See, when you let God pick them, they work. What you say, it's your thing, do what you want to do. That's it. <laughs> but see, it's God's choice. Carly, that's, a, that's God's choice. I know. I married you guys. I have peace about it. That's God's choice. Okay? When you know it's God's choice, it works. I don't worry about Sean and Beth. I, I picked her. <laughs> that's a joke. You knew that was coming. My son gave up. He said, Dad, I'm, I picked the wrong one every time. I'm through dating, man. You just, I ain't going to do it anymore. I'm going to trust you. He said that. To, he literally said that to me. I came back one time from uh, being out preaching. So I think I found your wife, son. I wasn't being spooky spiritual. I said, yeah, I think, I think this is the one. And he went and met her. And guess what? Within six months, they were married. Been married how many years now? Thirteen. It works. Hallelujah. Well, let's keep on going. Unbelief doesn't pray. I want to end up end up by saying this. Um, well, Hebrews chapter ten verse thirty five says, "Cast not away your, your therefore your confidence, for it has great recompense or payback, a reward. For you have need of patience. We all need patience. The Bible says so right there. That after you've done the will of God, when after you've done the will of God, well, I want to reap it before I do it. No, I don't." You know, after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. See, God has promises, but you've got to do the will of God. At the end of that, prom- at the end of that promise, there's the, there's the benefit. Um, now, the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul, you know, God's got a soul. This is God talking. My soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them that draw back into perdition or back into sin, but them that believe to the saving of the soul. See, your soul, when you start, when your spirit man is trying to believe God for something, if you don't watch your soul, he will, he'll talk you out of it. He'll start drawing back. I don't think we can do this. We, you know, he's like that guy in the Wizard of Oz, lions and tigers and bears. He just starts, he, courage, you don't have any. He just wants to run. That's when you dig your heels and go, I'm not running. I'm trusting God for reconciliation. I'm trusting God to financially bless me with a better job. I'm trusting God for that my body's going to, I'm going to live and not die. I'm trusting, you know, whatever you're trusting, everybody in this room is trusting God for something. All right. But we're not, but those that draw back, we're not those people that draw back. Most people do. But we're those who believe to the saving of the soul. See, every time you get a victory in an area of your life, your soul gets to re- realize this, wow, it works. And then he goes, well, I'm on board now. And then he'll start working with you. When, you're, when your emotions and your mind, your logic and reasoning line up with God, and now your soul is like, hey, it works. Let's do it. When you started tithing or giving to God, I mean, that was the trip. I'm giving money away. You can see people in the offering sometimes going, and the wife's going, let it go. 
But you know, when, they, when God starts blessing their life and everything starts multiplying, then next, then, then those guys are like, boom, chaka, boom. They, they don't mind because they see it works. Yep. Hallelujah. He that wants friends, present yourself friendly. Oh, I'm shy. See, the soul has 50 reasons why they can't present themselves friendly. I'm shy. I'm, I'm timid. I'm, in other words, it means the same thing. Okay, you can you can you can sit there and be, you know, it's, I'm not like you. I'm not an extrovert. I'm an introvert. Whatever, you know, extroverts and introverts are both soulish strengths. It's not a spirit thing. It's a soul thing. You know, Beth is kind of a stuffer. She's an introvert, but she, you wouldn't know it. Hello, she couldn't express herself. Where'd she? How'd she get like that? She it wasn't always where she could. And I'm not saying she's a big mouth. I'm just saying. She can't express herself now. That was not easy in the early days. What happened? Her soul started realizing and started doing God's word, and it makes you get out of that shit. You know, your soul is going to make you a boring person. I wish I was born with a bubbly personality like you. It wasn't bubbly like that at, at the beginning. I'm just too afraid. I'm just, what if people reject me? What do you mean, what if? They will. That's, that's a given in life. A lot of people are going to reject you. But what about, what about the ones that accept you and love you? See, if you're afraid to love, you're going to miss out on some of the greatest joys in life because you're going to miss out on people loving you back. But what if they don't? Well, some won't, but what, what, what if they do? Amen? All right. Won't find that out unless if your soul keeps you. Well, I was hurt one time. I had my heart broken in love. I saw this thing on Animal Planet one time about this woman that was a hoarder with dogs, had like 15 dogs, big dogs. A nice house, too, a really nice neighborhood, but had all these dogs. And I'm trying to think, okay, where, where did this happen? And if you listen to people, you can figure this out. She starts talking. She said, well, I was divorced five times. And she said, I just, at one point, just gave up on men. I, did, I, just, I just know they're going to hurt me. And she started pouring all her love and affection in animals. People do that sometimes because animals love unconditionally. So I knew that something had happened to her. I knew that she had been hurt and didn't recover from it. See, people, we can recover from hurts. You can recover from them. If you're not once burned, always burned. Or else we might as well always give up. We can change. Everybody's been in this room has been victims. Everybody in this room has been a violator. It's true. We've all been we've all been we've all been victims of other people's abuse or hurts or whatever or judgments or whatever, and we've all hurt other people. Okay, so we're not going to sit here with a contest who hurts the most. Jesus came to save us, so we don't have to keep keep hurting. Hallelujah. Well, I want to end by saying this. First Peter one twenty two says. Since ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. How do you purify your soul? Obeying the truth. You'll never obey if you don't pray. Because your soul will talk you out of why you should finish why you should finish this race. We're all in a race. Prayer is a race running. You believe in God for something. Until you cross the finish line, you're still you're in that race. Um since since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. The sincere love of the brethren, um, love one another fervently with a pure heart. This isn't in your notes. I just put this in this morning. Your confession, what you're saying and telling everybody all the time, your confession comes from what you believe. What you believe comes from your thinking. Your thinking comes from your knowledge. And your knowledge only comes from one, one or two sources. When you start believing for something, you have two two sources of knowledge. You can listen what God says about the situation, or you can listen what the devil says about the situation. There's only two sources of knowledge in the earth, people. So listen to which one you can listen. If you listen to the devil, you won't reap. You won't win. You'll give up the race. You'll quit, and you'll you'll not grow up. And you'll be forty, fifty years. You started when you're a teenager. Forty years from now, you'll still be worried about the same things you worried about when you were in high school. Because you don't automatically grow up unless you confront these things and, and deal with them. Fears. Man, don't be fearless people. Fear will rob you of all kinds of things. 
You go swimming? No, I'm afraid of the water. I'm afraid I'll drown. Learn how to swim. Do your kids go to the pool? Oh, don't take my kids to the pool. No, no. They, 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 we're afraid of the water. See, a lot of times your fear is you and stealing other people. You, discipleship reproduces by association. If you don't get whole, you can't bring wholeness to your children. How many of y'all want, want your children to be whole? You don't want them to have all the hang-ups you had. Amen? That's why we got a Savior. We got to thank you, Jesus. But the key is dealing with your soul. Going home, look in the mirror and going, you're, a big, you're my biggest problem. Here for years, I was blaming the devil. Turns out, it's you. It's your fears. He might have initially made you, you know, put fear in your life about something, but you kept it. God's been trying for years to get rid of that fear. You keep hanging on to it like it's some, it's a treasure. No, oh, this is my, my fear. This is what keeps me from doing anything. Agoraphobic. It's the fear of leaving your home. Agoraphobic. See, in the Western part of the world, we don't believe in spirits and stuff like that. So we, we just change the name of it. We give it a name we're comfortable with. Agoraphobic. Oh, you're afraid to leave your house? Yeah. Arachnophobia. Afraid of spiders? Yeah. We, whatever phobia you got, whatever name you give it, then that's, you know, schizophrenic, per, multiple personality. Yeah. How about spirits? Manifesting. It's amazing in the last few years how many more diseases are just coming up with. It's like, it's like where all this stuff come from? Didn't turn out just in the last 20, 30 years, all our children are hyper. You know, there's a correlation between when people quit disciplining their children and the kids getting hyper. Hmm, is it the sugar? What is it? No, it's they don't know the word no. There's no consequences for bad behavior. We actually reward it. Kid throws a fit in the supermarket. Mom's like, please, you're embarrassing me. I want a candy bar. Here. You rewarded bad behavior to save your own embarrassment. Remember I told you? A child left to himself is his mother's shame. He's just hungry. He's t- <laughs> we make excuses for it. And we keep doing that. And then one day that when they hit those teen years, they're coming to mom going, give me the keys to the car. And now they're physically strong enough to force things. And these poor women show up, end up on Oprah and Dr. Phil, and everybody's going, what's wrong with these poor women? These kids didn't come out of the womb with, with a switchblade. <laughs> Doctor's like, hey, what's wrong with this kid? He didn't come out cutting anybody. <laughs> he didn't spank them, and the, and the kids started cussing them out. He, you know, They all came out like you and me. We disciple them to be like this. We left rebellion in the heart of a child when he gets older. It gets bad. So, you say, oh, are you, is this a teaching on the soul or a teaching about children? I want to tell you something. There's a correlation between both. This teaching will help you grow up, but it'll also help, help you teach your children how to grow up. It's a double whammy. It's, a, it's free. It's a double blessing. <laughs> so you're going to learn how to grow up and how, to, how your children grow up. Because mom and dad, the more peace you have, the more you can give to your children. You can't give what you don't have. The more you overcome fear and the more fearless you are, the more you, the more fun your children will have. You ever meet these little kids that had never done anything? You know, you want to ride in the quad? Oh, no, mom says I can't ride in the quad. Quads kill people. Yeah. No, I think drunks, crazy people kill people, but I don't think it's the quad itself. Maybe somebody taking chances they shouldn't have done. Yes, people get hurt. But, you know, that's part of why we go out and play. You, you play sports? No, mom says that you, you get people get... It's amazing how many statistics people know. They know how many people have died in, by, hit by baseballs. They know how many people have been hit by golf balls. They know how many people have been have drowned. They know every statistic on everything bad that's ever happened. And that's why they can't, their children don't play, you know. And that's so sad because fear is holding these people hostage to some of the greatest experiences in life. You ride roller, you want to get on that roller coaster? No, mama said, mama says, mom's did her research and God bless <laughs> Man, between Siri and and Google, these poor kids ain't got a chance. Because they can get instant information. How many people have died on roller coasters? In the U.S., 6,000. Get off that ride now! Mom, I'm almost, I'm almost, I'm almost, I've been in here for an hour and a half. I'm almost be able to, get off now! You're gonna die! 
I know that's extreme. I'm being kind of funny. But it, some kids are probably watching this on, on, on the Internet going, no, that's, that's my mom. That's the, that ain't funny. That's how I live. Mom, I got something for you to watch. <laughs> See, if we don't overcome this stuff, our children won't overcome it. Teach them how to swim. Don't teach them to be afraid of water. Teach them how to play sports and do things. Teach them how to camp. Sit around a camp. Campfires, people have died. People. <laughs> you want a s'mores? What is that? That's a melted marshmallow out that's been put in the fire and you put it on a piece of graham cracker with some chocolate and you melt it together and it's, it's happiness out in the woods. It's that much sugar. <laughs> You know, at that time at night and all the dirt that's in your pores and the smell like a burnt pine cone, that is one of the most awesome things in the universe. <laughs> but Mama says, I can't have one because Johnny had one of those and he burned his finger. Well, I'm sorry, Johnny's ruined it for you. Don't, just pray you don't have clumsy friends. <laughs> you'll, you'll never, never experience life. How many of y'all know what I'm telling is true? It is. But so you're gonna train your soul to watch it in place of pressure, and then you're gonna teach us you're gonna learn how to pray so you can stay on course till you get the, the end result what you're praying for. And watching your prayer strengthens your spirit and weakens your soul. That's why Jesus went back three times when he was praying in Gethsemane to get his soul where it could go to the cross. Because it tried to talk him out of it the first time around. Which I'm glad he didn't. All right, is that encouraging? Well, this stuff really has application to everyday living. I'm not used to that. I like sermons that are abstract, that really don't... You walk away going, I don't even know what that meant. Yeah, it was good service, wasn't it? Yeah, I don't have a clue. Now I can't be judged because I don't know anything. Now, you're going to learn some stuff here that's going to make you deal with reality. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The word truth there means reality. He is the reality. We can live victorious, peaceful lives if we just do it. Science says just do it. Just do it. Can't you just pray for me and fix me? Nah. Don't work that way. You got you to learn how to do it yourself. I can teach you, but ultimately you got to do it. Amen? I can't just pray, swim in Jesus' name. Boy, that was amazing. No. You know, if you're, when you're 50 year old and got floaties, it's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> you didn't learn when you was a kid. Somebody's got to, got to teach you now. Amen. Hopefully we can do it a little more dignity in a private pool somewhere, hopefully. But, you know, we can teach you how to swim. Don't be afraid of things that God intended us to have fun with. Amen. All right. You encouraged? Good. Go and sin no more. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.